Hello, this is Edith Neumeyer, and I am the author of the book, The Mystery of Adam. I am not going to continue my studies on Revelation today. I have done some more research on this development of this false end time doctrine. I just get so upset because almost every person that has something on the internet today, all the big theologians and even the little ones, because they borrow from the big theologians, they have the wrong idea about end times. And I have done a video not too long ago about this Jesuit professor from the 16th century, Francisco Ribera, who came up with this false idea about the Antichrist, this Antichrist that will come at the end times during the tribulation. Okay? And I said already that this is a false doctrine that most people, even the, the important theologians that we have today, the big theologians uh, have today, that they are totally affected by this false teaching. It seems like nobody sees the truth about the end times. Nobody. Even the people who finally decide, oh, wait a minute, maybe this false doctrine about the Antichrist, this one-man Antichrist, is false. They're still not changing everything. It's the same thing with the Reformation. Unfortunately, the Reformation didn't change everything. They didn't say, hey, the heck with the Catholic Church and left it. They didn't do that which was very, very bad because Revelations tells us, leave Babylon the Great, okay? Leave her. Get out of her, my people. Uh, it doesn't say reform uh, Babylon the Great. And that's why I guess the Pope still has this hope that all these other evangelical churches will come back to Mother, Mother Church. But what we need to do is we need to really um, reform or take, I mean, we need to get out of uh, Rome, okay, Rome. So I did some more research and I came across dispensationalism, okay, so that the theology about dispensation and there's lots of people now that speak out against that and I, I never wanted to have anything to do with dispensationalism because I didn't believe in it. I don't believe in these man-made theologies. Somebody comes up with this man-made theology, okay? And dispensationalism is wrong. And, and I actually saw a really good film. Unfortunately, the film that I saw doesn't go far enough. And I'm going to explain that today because you will see quite a lot about people going against dispensationalism and throwing out a lot of what dispensationalism came up with. But they also throw out, or they don't throw out actually enough. And so then they are just going wrong with other things. So I want to look at that today. Now, I already talked about Francisco Ribera, this uh, professor that started this idea, this theology about this end time um, antichrist. But this guy also um, taught some other bad things that eventually totally screwed up um, our theology about the end times. So I don't want to talk about these other men that were crucial in really pushing this theology of uh, Ribera because there were several, uh, like there's one, of course, in um, the Catholic Church that pushed that in the 18th century, and I can might as well name him, Manuel Lacunza. La La and then in the 19th century, it was picked up by Edward Irving, um, which also, of course, was a, um, an English theologian, okay? And he then uh, kind of uh, influenced John, John Darby. And that is when 
I guess we, uh, it affected the evangelical church with John Darby and what John Darby made out of all this stuff because he came up with this dispensationalism. Now, Darby himself did not have very much influence and it probably wouldn't get any, wouldn't have gone anywhere with just Darby alone. But Darby uh, very much um, influenced Schofield. And Schofield brought these ideas as of uh, dispensationalism and these uh, false end time doctrines, you know, to the regular people. Schofield, I mean, gave out or whoever did, um, you know, sponsor Schofield, and there was somebody who sponsored Schofield, they gave out Schofield Bibles all over in seminaries and all over. And I know I grew up, well, I shouldn't say I grew up. I grew up Catholic. But when I became a believer, my first Bible was a Schofield King James Version. So I studied my King James. Matter of fact, um, my Schofield, King James Schofield um, Bible is pretty worn out. Okay. It got so worn out, I had to get another one. And now I'm realizing that I was very much influenced by a false belief about the end times. And one of these beliefs, I figured out, well, I shouldn't say I figured out it myself, but the Holy Spirit showed me how wrong it is. And that is this idea that there is going to be this one world ruler, this Antichrist at the end, and possibly during the tribulation. That is all wrong. But there's many more things wrong. And when people look at this dispensationalism, they don't even realize another thing that is blatantly wrong. And because it is blatantly wrong, they still continue to misinterpret that part about the end times. And I'm talking about the tribulation. That is part of this um, dispensationalism. Okay. Now, what is dispensationalism? Dispensationalism is uh, dividing the time of the Bible, so human history, into different sections. And one of the sections we're in right now, and they say that is called the church age. And that church age is, um, and, and during that church age, people are saved through grace. And there's another dispensation, which was the Jewish, or I shouldn't say Jewish, the Hebrew dispensation, or the Hebrew time, well, people were saved by the um, by the law. Now, all this is wrong. Okay, all this is wrong. Of course, then they tie into oh, and the Jews. Uh, there's the seventy years of Daniel, and the seventy years are not totally fulfilled yet, and there's still one week left. So, at the end, the Jews are still going to get a week, like after the church age, and that they call the tribulation. And so the whole thing just gets really messed up. Now, I have already said that I just totally don't agree with this kind of stuff. It also gives rise of Zionism and the claim of the Jews that uh, before Christ returns, they will have their own um, land, which is false. It's not biblical. But many people use that then again. And falsely, even more falsely, interpret the Bible. So, I finally found out why all this stuff is messed up. And one thing they have not explained, many Bible scholars, they may go against uh, many things that this dispensationalism is saying, but they don't address, okay, they don't address this false teachings about the tribulation. And that is the false, that's a false teaching. So today I want to address that again. Looking at these false teachers that have been uh, messing up our theology and are misleading really most of the, the, the churches. Most of the churches are influenced by this teaching of Schofield. Okay, 
Now, this guy Schofield, again, the, 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 uh, the person that continued this the effort of Schofield was then a guy called uh, Louis Sperry Schaefer. Uh, and he, of course, was very big um, in the um, Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, I am not very pleased about the Dallas Theological Seminary, but um, a lot of good, well, a lot of theologians that we regard as really Christian theologians today are influenced or come out of that Dallas Theological Seminary, but also some bad people, okay, like um, Grudem, who um, are totally um, pushing this false idea that men and women do, cannot have um, the same offices in the church. I'm going to say it that way. They believe, oh, we're equal, but we're not that equal that women can be uh, having the same offices in church as uh, male, their male brothers. Okay? So I totally, um, as you know, from my videos and my book, I'm totally against that. I believe there's total equality because the Holy Spirit gives each person gifts and he doesn't distinguish between men and women. Okay? He pours out the gifts of the Holy Spirit on each individual regardless of gender. And these people coming out of this theological, I mean, this Dallas the Theological Seminary, uh, spread a false doctrine. And sometimes it's called the doctrine of womanhood and manhood. Um, and that doctrine is absolutely false. Matter of fact, these people even went as far as saying that um, there is no equality in the Trinity. They had to come up with this idea that the Father is above the Son. And, and I don't know where they put the Holy Spirit. But they they actually came up with this idea that there is a hierarchy in the Trinity. Now, Grudem, in the meantime, has already said, no, that's not true, um, that's wrong, um, I made a mistake. Um, but, of course, they have to do that in order to um, not be, you know, attacked, because that's a fundamental Christian, you know, belief. So, anyways, but out of this Dallas Theological Seminary have come more bad theology that I know of, okay? So this is another one that has come out of specifically, and it's not just the Dallas Theological Seminary. These people actually um, corrupted all kinds of seminaries. Like I said, they gave out these Schofield uh, Bibles free to these um, uh, seminary students that became uh, pastors worldwide, worldwide. And so... Through that, I mean, the pastors for the past generation, they were infiltrated and they were falsely taught about this end time um, theology. So finally, I, 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 I kind of completed this threat that I, was, I thought did exist. And who is behind this? Well, the Jesuits, okay? They say that the Jesuits actually pushed this agenda, which is, okay, it's the Jesuits' plan to counter the Reformation, to infiltrate the evangelical churches, to bring them back to Mother Church. That's what the Jesuits' goal is. And so that is what their goal is. They have to infiltrate, number one, um, distract from the fact that that the Roman Catholic Church is the Antichrist and mislead people from the truth about the end times. So when Jesus said there's going to be lots of false teachers at the end, Paul said that as well. Yes. And right now we are absolutely infiltrated and totally confused by many false teachers. Many. Because they were all you can trace it back. They were all um, affected by this dispensationalism, which is 
absolutely wrong. It is wrong. Okay? So let me tell you what I have learned about the Bible. Okay? And my new book is actually about that. Uh, the new book that I am right now writing. And I have already uh, talked about it on my uh, channel under the mystery of the last Adam. I talk quite a lot. I have a whole series of videos that talk about the Messiah. Now, this is in, you know, kind of bottom line what my book is saying. That God, we human being, we failed. God's plan was always to have a relationship with human beings, a very close relationship. But that plan failed when humankind fell, when humankind followed Satan instead of God in the garden. They fell, they rebelled against God. And when they rebelled against God, God, actually God already came up with a plan before they even rebelled because he knew they would rebel, okay? So from the beginning, he already had a plan B. Or was it really plan A? I don't know, but it's plan B because that's the next one that he had. So he came up with this plan, how he could again reconnect all human beings to himself. And that plan was that he himself had to become a human being and die for us. Okay, That was his plan. Because Satan, who deceived us, said it has to be a perfect lamb, a perfect human being who can only be used as a sacrifice. If you want to watch um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that is a way how C.S. Lewis kind of, uh, in, in, in kind of symbolism, showed us that exactly. So he said only a perfect person, perfect human being, can be a sacrifice. There has to be a sacrifice because human beings failed and they had to die because they rebelled against God. So there had to be a sacrifice given in order that humankind can be um, redeemed. So God came up with himself becoming that sacrifice. He himself would become a man and take the place a fallen humankind. And because he took that place, all humans could now be rescued or could now again be connected to God. Okay? Now we're talking about all of humankind, not just one group of people, all of humankind. God's intention is for all of humankind to be able to reconnect to God, okay? Now, we have, that is true. We have kind of almost like three section. Uh, humankind is, div is divided into three sections. The first section, which in, in each section is about 2,000 years. The first section is from Adam to Abraham. That is the pre-Hebrew Hebrew, um history of humankind. So how were people saved between Adam and Abraham? Of course, through faith in Messiah. Okay? Everybody was saved through Messiah. So how are we, how are they saved? Messiah died. So what do we have to do? We have to follow him. We have to believe that he actually died for us, and then we have to follow him. We have to accept him as leader. That's the way it is, okay? First 2,000 years, that's the way it was. And God used certain people during that time, okay? Like, because most people were astray. But each generation, it seems like, he had another person that spoke out for God, Methuselah. And then there was Enoch that was, was speaking. So you can go back to um, the old, the uh, the pre-flood period and see that. Then he had um, um, Noah. You know, Noah uh, during Noah's time, it was so bad 
human beings were so bad, they didn't follow God, okay? They were so wicked and so um, evil that God destroyed the earth, okay? So, but uh, no, I mean, Noah was just in God's sight because he followed him. And he and his family, at least three sons that we know of, he may have had more kids. These were saved as well, okay? We know of three sons that were saved, and it could be that he had more. But these people were saved. Why? Because they were the only ones that followed God. Now, his kids, I am not 100% sure if they all followed God. We know that one of them was a rebel, and that was Ham. Okay? There was Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And we know that Shem was a priest of God. He followed God. Okay? Shem is the one that continued um, the priesthood that was actually of a, a Noah. Okay? He was the priest of God that told people, hey, um, this is God. This is what he wants. And so Shem was the one who, again, even after the flood, taught all the people that wanted to hear. And of course, even after the flood, the people still went astray. And one of them was Abraham. And Abraham learned from Shem the ways of the Lord. So how was he saved? He was saved through faith. But not just blind faith, not just, oh, yeah, I believe faith, okay, which so many people nowadays believe. Oh, I, I'm going to say I, I'm saved and therefore I'm saved. No, that's not what it is, okay? Abraham believed God and he did the works needed. When you do not follow up your faith with works, your faith is dead and it doesn't, there is no faith, okay? What did Abraham do? He believed God and he did what God told him to do. That's what faith is. Faith is nothing but following. Your faith has to be followed up by works. And I'm not talking about the law. I'm talking about works. In other words, you have to show that you're actually trusting God. If you don't show it, how in the world do you know or anybody knows that you're actually trusting him? Uh, you, you, don't, you can't do that. Okay? So Abraham was saved because he trusted God. Number one, he trusted him that, that Jesus Messiah died or is going to come to die for our sins. Okay? They had to believe that. Okay? So he's the father now of the Hebrews. So this message that God had, the oracle of God, and, and Hebrew says it's the oracle of God, was given to the Hebrews to keep, but not to keep and put it in a drawer. But it was for them to evangelize the whole world. And what did the Hebrews do? They didn't evangelize the world. Abraham, or, I mean, Abraham told everybody, okay? But what did the Hebrews eventually do? Did they evangelize the world? No. They became more and more stuck and they became more and more selfish and thought that this oracle that they received was just for them. Okay? Well, it went that far that God said, hey. And again, their deeds were not following their faith. So they, you know, followed other idols. And God said, no, this is not what I have bargained for. I have made a covenant with you that you will obey my laws, not that you have other idols. So 10 tribes of Israel were actually all of them were sent into exile. He divorced all of them. He totally put away with the contract that he had with them on Mount Sinai because they rebelled against him again. Okay. Remember, we are saved through faith in God and following him, okay? We're not saved through just saying, oh, I am a Jew, or I'm an Israelite, or I am saved. That's not how we are saved, 
we're saved by following Jesus, by following God, by following the Messiah. Okay, so all people are saved through the same thing. Yes, the Jews got the law. Why? Because God was really upset with them. Okay, because they were rebelling the minute they stepped um, out of Egypt, they were rebelling. And God said when Moses was up on the mountain and they rebelled and they built this calf, this idol, their own little, you know, their own little worshiping thing, right? What they're doing today again with building um, an altar that is not even approved by God, okay? They're building an altar that is not even approved by God. And they're worshiping their own stuff again, their own idolatry. I mean, their own ideology, let's put it that way. They're doing that right now. So when when they did that on Mount Zion, God said, I mean, he wanted to just get rid of them right then and there, smite all of them. But Moses interfered and said, God, you can't do that. So what did he do? He put them under the law. He put them under the law. He said, hey, you can follow these. Okay. If you do not follow these laws, you are gone. I don't want to have anything to do with you. So what did they do? They didn't follow the law again. Okay, they made up their own idols. And you know what? All tribes did that. All tribes. And so God divorced them. He said, my contract with, with you is null and void. However, and that's what makes it a little strange, because the Jews, the descendants of Judah, which made up the kingdom of Judah, they were allowed to return, but they never received their land back. Never. Okay? Don't be fooled. They came back, but they never owned their land. Never. They, uh, they were allowed by every kingdom to stay there. Okay? But they didn't get the land back. Never had the land. Never. Okay? They were always under rulership of the Persian the Greek, and the Romans. And then when they rebelled against the Romans, uh, the Romans kicked them out. Okay? Kicked them out. So, however, what I'm trying to say is, yes, they were under the, 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 you know, the law, but the law is not what saved them. They knew, too, that the lambs and the sacrificial things were only symbolic. Okay, God himself always says in the Old Testament, I am your savior. Okay, I am your savior. I'm your savior. I'm your savior. They knew that. The thing is, with the Jews today, they don't even listen to their prophets. Okay, they don't even listen to their prophets. They have Talmud and they listen to the interpretation of somebody who is giving them an interpretation about their prophets because they don't hear the prophets. They don't listen to the prophets, okay? So they cannot know what the prophets are saying. So if you ever, you know, hear something about, a, you know, a Jew talking about the Old Testament, you need to read it for yourself because you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you, will may, you may be able to see something different than what they teach you. And there's many sections which I have addressed already that are falsely interpreted because the Jews don't see the truth. They do not see Messiah in the prophets. The prophets talked about Messiah, okay? And they totally put it away. They don't recognize their Messiah. It's their Messiah. It's not even ours. It's not the Gentiles' Messiah. It's their Messiah. You know, Messiah came from the Jews, from the tribe of Judah. Okay, what prophet do the Jews have? Yeah, they have lots of prophets. The prophet is that they have Messiah coming out of their own tribe. Is one of his own brothers. That's their prophet. What's another prophet? Yeah, they got the oracle of God. They were given instructions from God. And what are they doing with it? They cannot even read it because they, 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 they rebel against God. Okay, so but all that infiltrated also in these false teachings. But these people, they added something to the theology that make people today believe all this false even teaching of the Zionists. They came in 
and they totally messed up all of our thinking, okay, of what is true. Therefore, I am saying you need to wake up people, okay? Yes, there's people out there right now that are speaking against this, um, uh, what do you call it, um, dispensationalism. They speak out against it, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, they have the right, um, you know, idea. But they fail. They fail as, uh, as well. And the reason why they fail is because they don't address the false teaching of dispensationalism, which is the Great Tribulation. Okay? And I can see that I need to make another video about this. Now, I have addressed this false teaching about the tribulation before. And I said, you know, I believe it ties in with this um, false belief about the Antichrist. And I was right. Okay, I was right. This uh, Francisco Rivera, uh, if you can see, it comes out of, you know, into Dar uh, Darwinism and, um, you know, Schofield. They're all teaching the wrong thing about the tribulation. And people actually have that ingrained in themselves. I did because I read Schofield. Okay? So until I had to read really the Bible and say, wait a minute, is that word even in the Bible? Is the word Antichrist even in Revelation? Is it even in um, the Old Testament? Is it anywhere? Is the, you know, does it anywhere talk about the Antichrist and this end time Antichrist? No, it isn't. The same thing is true with tribulation. It is not. It is not in Revelation. And so, therefore, any time I talk about great tribulation in regards to wrath, it is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. So when people say, well, I am pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, it's wrong. You can say, well, I am post-wrath. You can say, well, I am mid-wrath. But there is no evidence that there is any mid-wrath. Okay? No evidence whatsoever. Look at Revelation and you look at the wrath of God, which you see three times. And I have said that. Not one time can you see the saints in heaven in the midst of the tribulation. You always see them in the I mean, before the, the wrath even starts. But when you talk about tribulation, you get messed up. There is no such thing as pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Okay, the rapture, and that is another thing that people mess up, is the rapture. The understanding about the rapture will be totally screwed up when you think in terms of tribulation. Because the church is going through tribulation. Okay, church is going through tribulation. Right now, we have the church age. Remember I said 2,000 years, 2,000 years pre-Abraham. Um, uh, 2,000 years Hebrew history, 2,000 years um, Gentile history. So during these periods, um, the Hebrews had their chance to witness to the world. Now the Gentiles have a chance to witness to the world. They're given the oracle of God right now. Okay? They're giving the Holy Spirit, the oracle of God right now, to tell you, listen to Messiah, follow Messiah. And that's what the Gentiles are doing. Now, it's not just the Gentiles. They're not just included in the church. It's everybody. Okay? It's everybody. The Jews and the Gentiles are part of the church. It's just the Gentiles are mainly the ones that are bringing the gospel forth and have been bringing the gospel forth. Okay, that's all there's to it. But this church age is coming to an end. Okay, uh, and I'm calling it church age. It's really, uh, Jesus is talking about the age of the Gentile. If you want to look at, uh, it's in Matthew 24. You look at Jesus saying until the age of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So when that age is finished, then the church is being taken. Now, who belongs to that church? everybody okay from the time of 
Adam and Eve to the end of the church age. All the people. Why? Because Jesus, when he died, he went into Hades. And he got the Old Testament believers. Not every Jew, not every Hebrew. Okay? Believers. All the believers. Since Adam and Eve. He went down to Hades and he got them out and took them where? To heaven. Now, where's heaven? That's what Jesus is. Kind of hard to say. But when you look at Revelation, um, Revelation 6, or no, 5, where the saints are under the altar, these people are already there. Okay? These are all the believers throughout all of history. They will be part of of the bride of Christ because that's what God what God's plan is that from the beginning he wanted everybody who believes in him okay regardless of you Jew Gentile or whatever you are Hebrew whatever you are okay you are part of God you're part of the Messiah if he died for you and you're following him you're part of his bride and that's his plan if you want more information uh, listen to my videos about the mystery of the last Adam. Okay, it's very important. So I'm already uh, way over, you know, my time. And, but this is very important. So all this goes down or goes back to this dispensationalism and all the way back to this Francisco Rivera. Okay, and these these people seem to be these people that are against dispensation. They are still not waking up about the tribulation. Okay, the tribulation is what the saints went through. Okay, that's what the tribulation is. You know, I may do another you know study about the tribulation because it is so false doctrine, so false, and nobody wants to see it, and it leads into so many false interpretations of the rapture and of everything. Why do people not just call it the wrath of God? See, even these people that are against this dispensationalism, they don't understand that the wrath of God has not come. Read about the wrath of God. That is going, and I don't know, again, I think I may have to do another one. Because see, this tribulation, I have talked about how long this tribulation is. That my, most people think it's seven years. And I call it the wrath. It's the wrath of God at the end. Okay? It's not seven years, most likely. Uh, I don't know how, how long it is, but um, it, it is as long as it takes for God to to throw out his wrath. That's how long it is. Um, I don't think it can be very long because things get so destroyed that after a while there's nothing left. Okay? So, anyways, um, I want to finish up. And if I have to say more about this, um, watch for my next video. I may just say more. But this is the false thing that I have seen, is this leading into this um, tribulation thing, great tribulation, that is absolutely wrong. And I know I have talked out about it, but now I have the proof what really, why this tribulation, why people are still talking about this tribulation. So let the Holy Spirit guide you. And do some research about this. Um, it's on Revelation timeline decoded. Okay, there you can find this information about, um, you know, this uh, this um, dispensationalism information about dispensationalism. Oh, again, remember this guy that has this webpage revelation timeline decoded. And I think, is it Mike? I don't remember. But um, I, don't, I don't agree with him on everything, especially because he doesn't recognize the wrath of God and he mixes it still up with the tribulation. And if you do that, you will mess up the rapture as well. And you will not be able to see when the rapture is and, and, and even what the rapture is. The rapture is simply people being taken out, the bride of Christ being taken out before God smites this earth with the wrath. That's all it is. Okay? That's all it is. So, I will finish up though. Um, 
again, let the Holy Spirit guide you.